Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association of West Papua, actualizing UDHR Article 20 in the Asia Pacific. Today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by an amazing activist who is very much dedicated to the important issue of freedom of assembly and association. Rudy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jessica, for the time. Can you share with me, why is this issue of peaceful assembly and association so important in international human rights law, especially where you live? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the time. And uh, currently in, in West Papua, uh, the freedom of assembly is uh, being uh, a thing that is often denied by the states. Uh, it is important to fulfill and protect because uh, from that bottom we can uh, we can understand what the people needs. I mean, uh, if 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 you let the people assemble and if you let the people uh, express what they want, then you you can solve the problem. I think that is the basic right human rights where uh, the citizens can uh, participate in the uh, in the policy making and the development progress of a state. So uh, we cannot uh, we cannot deny that that right. So I think it's very important as mostly yeah. in, with not for was indigenous people. So we, we, are, we need more uh, interaction. No, you really covered it so well. It's it's a freedom of assembly, and it's paramount that if we don't have freedom of assembly, then the people can't come together, can have conversations, can't discuss, but also can't coordinate, in a way, campaigns to then actualize these 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I thought the point you made that was so crucial is also how every human right is interconnected, that there's freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, which of you could share with us a bit about unique aspect as indigenous peoples that West Papuans are, how that's important, but then freedom of speech to be able to share those ideas together. But then of course, most importantly, that element of self-determination and to actually assemble together and coordinate. Can you share with me what first inspired you to care about this issue so much and some of the first campaigns you've been involved with around freedom of assembly? Yeah, so uh, what what inspired me is the uh, is the story of my parents, is the story of uh, my par my mothers that they tell me uh, how we how it's difficult to uh, for for West Papuan people to gather and to express what they think, what they feel, or or uh, what they have been through in their life. So that is what inspired me to. Uh, to know to promote the uh, to promote what the people need, so that is why, uh, as we know, maybe there are a lot of uh, human rights violences in 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 West Papua, and uh, and when the time we are trying to we are trying to express it, it get banned by the state, it get uh, oppressed by the uh, by the force. So so I think it's just something that uh, we need to take more voice. So. According to the stories of my parents, according to the past experience, that is the the things that inspired me the most. And for my uh, my first uh, involvement to promote uh, human rights violation is when when I uh, you know uh, conducting a rally and make a campaign in social media about about human rights violations that is uh, going on in in West Papua. For the example, like the case of uh, mutilate or well, that the military members are uh, mutilate uh, force indigenous with Papuan that has happened uh, several years ago. So uh, we are that is my first uh, where I going to assemble the people to protesting. And finally the perpetrators are uh, broke to court for life sentence. And uh, yeah I think it's very important in crucial to assembly and to express our opinion. 
Thank you. And and you really bring up something that's so vital. It's, it's something that most people almost think is, is part of everyone's life to be able to assemble. Can you maybe share also a little bit more though about West Papua culture, about the history and how we got to where we are today, but more importantly also what people in West Papua are doing on a daily basis to actualize Article 20. Yeah, so uh, for the for the history of West Papua itself, uh, we are for the first in 18, we are colonized by the Dutch, uh, by the Dutch, and then it's, uh, uh, and then it's give to, to Indonesia through uh, egg of free choice in 1969, where uh, mostly West Papuan people thinks that it was uh, that it was full of violence, full of fraud. So uh, that is why the West Papuan people are still fighting for for their right to to self determination. And uh, we in in West Papua we are, we are still live in a culture of uh, in a in a culture of uh, indigenous people. Like we use the land, we we are uh, describe the land as a mother, where the source of our life and uh, that is totally opposite with uh, what the government will permit today. They just uh, destroyed the forest and uh, uh, didn't have uh, much uh, conversation or uh, relation with indigenous people, with West Papuan people. So it is sometimes uh, it is sometimes very uh, it is sometimes so far from what West Papuan indigenous West Papuan people need, and uh, that is the things that. Uh, uh, become the problems today in West Papua, and uh, mostly West Papua myth or youth, youth Papuans like me, we are trying to uh, build such a movement. Like uh, we are promoting uh, a peaceful demonstration and peaceful organ, peaceful uh, uh, approach to the to the conflict to be solved by the government by addressing the the core uh, the core thing is human rights, where uh, we are all have the the rights to be free, or and the rights to be, uh, the rights to to determine what we will be in the in the in the future. So there are a lot of things we we have done. Like uh, we make a we make a lot of organizations such as Papuan Speak on the, on the Instagram, and so there are so many civil society organizations in West Papua that created by the youth Papuans. So yeah, I think we are. We have to start to, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you so much. When we look at that, you're talking about self determination, but then you're also raising the important point of free prior and informed consent. It seems that there's many actions by the government that don't obtain the free prior and informed consent, and also inhibit the right of self determination. Can you share some of those aspects where the government has made decisions? That then have an uh, adverse impact on the people of West Papua. Yeah, and so we just assemble. Okay, for for the example, it's it's like uh, the new provinces in West Papua. So now there are six new provinces in West Papua, and it is without uh, adequate uh, adequate participation and not enough participation from the indigenous people. That is why there are a lot of mass protesting all over the West Papua, and maybe we can go back on the internet. We can see that that uh, the West Papuan people oppose that 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 kind of policy because uh, they see they see that uh, as a threat to the indigenous people's life because there will be a lot of uh, transmigration there. There there will be a lot of development that is that is uh, you know. Uh, Separating people from land, separating people from their culture, and for another example, it's like spatial autonomy. Uh, spatial autonomy since uh, 2001 has been uh, updated in 2020, 2021. Two years ago, it is without a uh, proper participation from the indigenous people. There are a lot of people protesting and. And the government responded by sending more troops to the region. So that is the, uh, you know, that is the real uh, example of how the uh, Muslim people strikes of uh, self determination to choose uh, 
how they supposed to live and how they just their life in the future is uh, so controlled by the remote control by the government. You know, bring it to a good point because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides the power of ideas to initiate change in the world. And UDHR outlines opportunities for a new direction rooted in inherent dignity and inalienable rights for dynamic, sustainable development and social democracy. And Article 20, focus on the important right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association to impact the public policy and practice of one's government for good. And when we look at it, though, it seems like there's a couple factors. There's rising militarism. There's also corporatism of corporations coming in without allowing peaceful assembly. And then also even that aspect of religion. You, of course, shared that aspect of unique relationship with Mother Earth. Can you maybe expand on those three examples of how the lack of being able to come together and being able to practice Article 20 are impacted by those three aspects of corporatism, militarism, and then, of course, that aspect of not respecting indigenous religion as well and spirituality. I think uh, how it... Uh correlate it, each other it is uh can be seen by uh by the uh the decreation of numbers of populations of indigenous people when uh when these three aspects came into force without prior consent it uh it affects uh their 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 populations i mean uh, when they uh, uh when the crops came and uh, when the uh, uh, when the crops came and uh, it make people fear they cannot assemble, and because the uh, the absence of the rights of the assembly, the people cannot express what they feel, what they think, and what they want, and then lead to any other rights that is being filed. So uh, I think this three aspect need to you know need to goes together need to apply together as uh, one body it we cannot uh be back to the to the people so, yeah, that's what i got from your questions maybe if it is no it's a great mm -hmm. great explanation of the solidarity and also the necessity of sustainability that we have to of course focus on mother earth first but then yeah. also you know to make sure that when people do the most basic aspect of standing up for what they believe in and assembling, that then the military or incorporations do not come in and directly impact people for just yeah. exercising the most basic right. Can you share with us some NGOs that are champions to create a culture of human rights in West Papua? You were sharing some aspects on Instagram and some other ways that people are utilizing social media, but in West Papua, maybe what are some of the most powerful, positive examples of exercising Article 20? And then more importantly, international NGOs that you feel are standing up in solidarity with West Papua. Mm. Okay. Uh, for the, for the NGO, I think, uh, okay. Uh, for the, for the NGO, I think, uh, they move in very diverse sectors. They just came from the environment sectors and then uh, uh, human rights sectors and indigenous people. So it is like there is uh, uh, like uh, Usaka and Talarakia and then others is like uh, Apple, it's based in UK and human rights monitor based in Germany. So. And uh, there are a lot of national, Indonesian national NGO that is uh, moving in the sector of uh, environment, and I think it's uh, it somehow uh, helped the help the voiceless people to raise their their voice up, and there are as well uh, posting and social media campaign like uh, what I've mentioned earlier, like the pop on speaks and pop on speak on the Instagram and. Uh, like uh, Jubi and Suara Papua, it is, it is a local local news that is uh, that is uh, uh, run by several uh, Papuan youth, where they are uh, trying to uh, give a 
Skype for Snarati from the mainstream media. So I think maybe we can take that out. It's like Jigicom and Swara Papua Com. It is run by maybe uh, Victor Mambor. It's a well-known journalist that maybe we can allow for him how he, how he uh, use the media to the people. So I think yeah, that's maybe, maybe there are a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of examples, but I think there, I think that is what I can no, explain here. Those are, are great examples and it's good to see the depth and how people around the world understand that their voice that they have when they have living in a democracy must be united to stand up with people who aren't able to exercise as those basic fundamental freedoms. So the examples you're sharing about Germany, about all over the world, plus also your response about Indonesia is important because then that shows that even in the belly of the beast of the colonizer, that people there know what's happening is wrong. That reminds me very much of really some of the most recent events we shared in Dili, in Timor-Leste, where we were able to be there on the 24th anniversary of the referendum. Can you share what it was like to be in Dili and how inspiring it is to meet with the people of Timor-Leste and their sense of solidarity with the people of West Papua and how you felt in that program, in the evening programs as well as the larger one? Yeah, uh, I just feel uh, so emotional, you know, like... <laughs> I just uh, cannot. Uh, I just cannot express what I feel. I just, I just stay quiet, and I think uh, how beautiful it is when the people no not only live in violence, live in, uh, live in, uh, live in, in dangerous. Like they don't have to be afraid of their land being taken. They could have been taken. So I think uh, when they show me the solidarity, it's an another spirit for for me to share to my fellow back in West Papua. And uh, I think that even at that time was very uh, memorable and fantastic. And uh, it just somehow become blessed for me to uh, memorable and fantastic. And uh, it just somehow become blessed for me to, uh, to keep on, uh, to keep on have a voice peacefully for the better world. And, uh, you know, for, so our, Human rights can be uh, protect, promoted, and fulfilled by by the that the barriers of the state. So I think uh, what they what they have uh, what they have shown in Delhi was so amazing. When people when we can see, even though uh, even though they have no like they have no like enough uh, welfare or uh, natural resources, but they live in a in a society where the human yeah, the more recent, and yeah, that's, that's it. I think what I feel that time, rather just. Uh... No, I agree. It's, it's, it's so special to be there on that holiday when yeah. even in the face of extreme violence, the people of Timor-Leste voted overwhelmingly for independence, for being able to take control of their future after centuries of colonization from various forms. And even as you brought up, losing 200,000 people out of 800,000 in just 24 years. That's quite an experience. So it wasn't easy. But more importantly, as you said, knowing that they were also under Indonesia, that they were able to become free, how does that inspire you to then assemble and then take action to realize what's possible? Yeah, I think. And take action to realize what's possible. Yeah, I think uh, the one thing that they have told me is about solidarity. I think I think that is the core of of power. When the, when we have solidarity, we can protest peacefully. We can use the peaceful way to promote peace. I mean, but that is through solidarity for all over the world. As a human being, we came together with uh, with the same problems. It is human rights violations and they are uh, denied of human rights protection. And I think when we have this uh, solidarity, it would be a, a weapon to to finally to erase all the human rights uh, abuses in in the world. So I think that is what inspired me. And I finally understand that 
solidarity is the key. Solidarity is the key. So we have to build solidarity with Hawaiian, with people, with Timor Leste, and Indonesian or self. We trying to put solidarity at the moment. Solidarity. It's true. Solidarity. It and it's not a theory, right? It's a transformative yeah. tool. You can see it directly applied, and you can see it in the eyes of of the people of Timor Leste that really one of us cannot have pure freedom until everyone has freedom. And when you see the way that they take action to set up a Western Sahara yeah. and an embassy to <laughs> look at issues anywhere in the world that if anyone's human rights are denied anywhere on earth, then all of our rights can never fully be realized. So I think that's what's so powerful. And Article 20 says, it's really essential to engage the people to participate in governance and promote human rights for all. And, and you can see that. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights calls for a coalition of conscience centered around trust and transformation while honor, honoring values, voice, and vision. And on the 75th anniversary, it's important to reflect on the role of human rights in our daily lives and world affairs. And you can actually experience it and feel that in Timor-Leste, maybe at a more visceral and beautiful level than most people feel because it, it's still only 24 years and it was rising out of the ashes of some of the most brutal situations anyone's faced in the history of humanity. Yeah, and you read how they, how they, uh, in the end, finally uh, can celebrate democracy and what they they enjoy joyful moments, joyful moments. That is fantastic. It is. Can you maybe share for people who don't know some of the major heroes of the human rights movement in West Papua historically and currently who have had such a huge impact to really bring to life Article Twenty? Yeah, impact to really bring to life Article Twenty. Yeah. For the first is what I what I want to let let you know, guys. It's Philip Karma. Philip Karma. Philip Karma. He was uh, he was a peaceful leader in West Papua, where in 1998 um, he was uh, uh, you know uh, make a demonstration in in Biak, and uh, and it's a totally peaceful demonstration. There is no weapons. It is just just voice and microphone. And all the posters they hold, and there is no weapons. But and then suddenly the the military came, and you know just like shooting indiscriminately. And it is uh, what we know that today is as a Biak massacre. So it's like Biak massacre. It's, it's a so uh, historical historical moment, historical day when the people are killed just because protesting, just because, uh, you know, assembly peacefully to protest what they like. So, yeah, the U.S. Papa, we know uh, Philip Karma and there is a lawyer. There is a lawyer as well promoting peaceful, peaceful movement, peaceful assembly to, to uh, freedom and, uh, and for the protection of human rights. That's the major human rights defenders in the rest of the Any others that you you would like to mention that people could learn more about exercising that Article 20? Yeah, it, uh, what I mentioned before is this like Victor Yemo. Victor Yemo is now in jail, like even though they called him. Victor Yemo is now in jail, even though they called him already. Uh, already said that he must set free, but the police didn't get him out of the jail. Trigimo, Jeffrey Winda, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, people, but the leaders, they, they are the leaders that, that is, uh, you know, make, make people assemble peacefully to demonstrate what they want. Jeffrey Winda actually want to, want to join this, this interview, but, uh, you know, but he has some business and he will, he will enjoy, he will happy to invite him in the next time. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Can you share with us, just taking a moment, 
and reflecting on the time in Timor-Leste, but also the idea of what's possible in West Papua. Can you share your vision for the future of the right of Article 20 in West Papua? Yeah, for us, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to, to have a good vision, especially when we know that Today, the government posts are the same approach, which is like military approach and any other. Today, the government posts are the same approach, which is like military approach and any other. But uh, I believe in, I mean, I still believe in solidarity when we keep, when we keep fight and we keep, you know, peacefully declare what we want, what we need for, for our better future. And I think there will be still a uh, there will be still, still future for human rights, especially when the year, when the year take action. Yeah. So there, if, if, if there are more, more and more people come to express, uh, like that, if, yeah, I can I give some other vision that maybe, I, I mean, I cannot give a vision that is impossible. I just trying to say what is written the reality in the field. <laughs> we, we fully understand. And we, your vision is very clear because it points out what is so important and that why these freedoms, these rights that are expressed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights over 75 years ago are so valuable in the daily lives and why people value them so much. So it's, it's truly there. And what you just though, is also reminds me of what President Jose Ramos Horta said, where he said, no empire lasts forever. So that then, in a way, nurtures that seed of hope that you were describing, that one day, soon, this can change, and more importantly, that people can then live and practice these basic human rights. And the UDHR Article 20 is one way people exercise their engagement for equality and guarantee good governance in every nation and global democracy for our collective planet. And the people desire dignity and to be part of this global family for freedom. We can hear that in your voice, how you yearn for these basic rights and how we have really a sense of solidarity, but also a duty to one another to make sure that human rights are recognized in West Papua and around the world. Thank you so much for joining us today and really appreciate you, not only all of your energy at the University of New South Wales Diplomacy Training Program, but also your commitment to social change and a better future for West Papua and everyone on earth. I mean, thank you very much, Yusuf, as well, for the time and chance. God bless. Aloha.